Welcome back. We left things on quite the cliffhanger, I know. Where we'd last left off, Draco Malfoy had died. Harry starts to scream. Then Harry turns and sees that Ron has run outside. Ron is kind of confused by the fact that Harry's here, but Harry's like, shut up, get him out of the water. Ron casts a spell, pulls Draco's body out of the water. He starts doing breathing spells on Draco. They don't seem to be working. Ron doesn't seem to know mouth to mouth, so... Harry's like, shut up, do what I tell you, and do it now. He quickly walks Ron through how to do mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, and Ron does it, but not before acting all grossed out by the fact he has to kiss Draco, because homophobia is always in season in this fanfiction. And this is an important moment in this story. I don't mean Ron giving Draco mouth-to-mouth, -mouth. I mean what's about to happen to Draco. So we've reached the point in the story that got Cassandra Clare's um, fanfiction account taken down. I've talked about this at length before, but long story short, basically Cassandra Clare had a bit of a habit of lifting one-liners and jokes and things from other sources and just putting them in her fanfiction. This is something that people knew she did. She didn't always cite things properly. The PDF I have does cite everything properly as far as I know, but she didn't at the time. And this chapter is significant because she didn't just take like a joke or two or three from a few different books or movies. She copied a bunch of passages verbatim from a published novel. She was caught, she got her fanfiction.net account deleted, she continued to publish her chapters somewhere else, but eventually she did write a new version of this chapter without anything lifted verbatim from another source. And that version of the chapter is the one that's in my PDF, and that's the one we're going to talk about. Draco wakes up, and he's in, like, this dark place filled with fog. He looks around a bit more, and then he sees a river, and he kind of walks up to it, and he looks into the river, and he sees a face. And then suddenly the face rises up. It's a full person. In fact, it's Rowena Ravenclaw. And she's like, Salazar? Is that you? More people are emerging from the water. A man and a woman. It's Godric Gryffindor and Helga Hufflepuff. Godric, he cannot be Salazar. He is only a child. They all stared at him. Draco was indignant. I'm 16. I'll be 17 in a few weeks. I wouldn't put money on that, said Godric, quite unkindly. Draco glared at him. It struck him that he did not like Godric. It also struck him that in order to free himself from the tragic and destructive cycle of history repeating itself, it might be wise to try to like Godric. These spirits explain where he is. The river they're in is filled with the spirits of people who are neither alive nor dead, which kind of raises questions about what a ghost is in the Harry Potter universe, but let's just go with it. The founders have been stuck in this river ever since they died because they have, like, unfinished business. They need to be avenged because Salazar Slytherin killed two of them and I mean, Rowena was a victim of those killings, essentially, just by witnessing them. They also explained that in order to defeat Salazar, he's going to have to find the founders keys. And Draco's like, I don't know what that is. And they're like, you'll figure it out. Don't worry. And then Draco looks up and he sees some other figures on the bank. The founders tell him that there are two people who want to speak to him. And in order to do so, he's going to have to give up some blood. I don't know how a spirit like him right now is supposed to have blood, but he cuts his hand. He squeezes a few drops into the river. And then those figures on the bank start to take proper form. And... They're Harry's parents. They get to talking. James Potter raised his eyes to Draco's, and they were not as green as Harry's were, but black. He said, I'm sorry I interrupted your conversation. Oh, said Draco. Oh, that that's all right. If you're Lucius's son, you must go to Hogwarts. And if you go to Hogwarts, do you know our son? His name is Harry, Draco finished. Harry Potter. Lily pushed forward. She was standing in front of James now. So do you know him? Her voice was light and wavering and very pretty. For some reason... Draco is really struggling to admit to the fact that they are actually quite close, that they are practically brothers, in fact, but he takes a breath. He tells them that Harry plays on Gryffindor's Quidditch team. After a moment, he realizes that's that, that's not enough. They, they want to know more. My father used to talk a lot about honor, the honor of our family, the honor of our bloodline, and our name. But in my life, I never saw my father do an honorable thing. I thought honor was just a term, like lineage or patrimony. That meant you'd been around for a while. But it's a real thing to have honor, and Harry has it. Harry is the first person you would want on your side in a fight, and the last person who would ever do an untruthful or an underhanded thing. Harry has more integrity than anyone else I have ever known. I'm sorry, he added, not sure if he was apologizing or simply expressing sorrow. Don't be, said James. I understand. You're fading, James went on, looking at Draco closely. Someone is calling you back. I'm sorry, he said again. 
No, it's a good thing. You can take a message with you. Don't tell Harry you saw us. It will just cause him pain. There's a man called Sirius Black. He's Harry's godfather. You might have seen him picking up Harry at platform nine and three quarters at the end of term. Find him. Tell him to go into his vault at Gringotts and to take from it what I gave him just before I died, and to give it to Harry. I never told him it was for Harry, but it is. Harry is the heir of Gryffindor. He'll be needing it soon. And tell Sirius that I- And then the river? The ghosts? James and Lily? They all fade away. Draco is being resuscitated now. Okay. I have a few thoughts. I am of the age where I am someone who is going to have a lot of nostalgia for Harry Potter, but I do try to emotionally disconnect to it to a degree, even when talking about this. Because, you know, Joanne is just terrible, and to think about the problems with Harry Potter and what Joanne is doing now, and all my, like, happy, soft memories, it's just, it feels icky, you know? With that said, this moment really did get to me, I have to admit. So like I said, that isn't the original version of the chapter. That one lifted a lot from a book called The Hidden Land. This has nothing taken verbatim from anywhere, but the footnote at the end of the chapter in my PDF did note that it is taking inspiration from the Odyssey. I think the only major difference is that, like, a voice that's not the Founders talks to Draco in that one, and Draco asks if he's in hell or not, and there's, there's a few small details, but broadly speaking, the scenes are the same. The interaction with the Potters is exactly the same. I don't think any of that was taken verbatim from anywhere. Anyhow, Draco opens his eyes. Draco's been woken up. Well, here we get our first example of what I was talking about in the last video when I said that Harry and Draco from now on are going to have a lot of telepathic conversations. Harry telepathically tells Draco that Ron had to kiss him. Love that. Then all three of them hear a pop, because Sirius Black has arrived, he has apparated. Hermione rushed down to tell him what was going on, and Sirius is like, I'm going to take care of things here. He waves his wand and sends Harry back to Malfoy Manor, because remember, Harry was like astral projecting for Malfoy Manor to be here. Hermione's all frantic because she thinks Draco's dead. Harry explains what just happened. They're good now. She also tells him that the love potion's effect is now gone. Because remember, Snape said that um, the only way to end the love potion would be through the death of one of the two people connected to it. Kind of clever. I'll, I'll say that much. Meanwhile, at the burrow, Draco is sat by the fire. He's got like a blanket and a nice cup of tea, warming himself up. And Sirius is there with him, and Draco looks at him and is like, I saw Harry's parents. And he tells Sirius about, like, the thing in his Gringotts vault. And Sirius is like, oh, you must have been hallucinating, Draco. It's nothing. But then he turns, and he kind of pauses, and he's like, oh shit, Draco went to the afterlife. I gotta get to Gringotts. Hermione and Draco are in the other room, hanging out with Ron and having biscuits. I guess Hermione operated over to the burrow as well. Hermione is now geeking out about, like, the scientific slash magical applications of what just happened. Draco was, like, medically dead, but he wasn't, like, actually dead, and yet that still took the spell off of him. And she's, like, geeking out about, like, the intersection of magic and science and all the possibilities this could bring, and, you know, it, it's cute. I like this moment, it's cute. Then Harry asks Ron, hey, how did you know all those, like, anti-drowning spells you were doing? Ron exchanges a glance with Ginny, and Ginny's like, It's fine. You can tell him. We had a brother, she said, looking down at her hands. In between Percy and Charlie, he drowned in the quarry when he was three years old. We never knew him, but Mum and Dad have insisted on all of us knowing anti-drowning spells, just in case anything ever happens. Harry and Hermione are, understandably, very uncomfortable. Why didn't they just fill in the quarry, wondered Hermione instead. Ron shrugged. You can't. They tried. It's got some sort of magical protection on it. Filled in, it just reappears the other day. Oh, the quarry. The quarry that Mr. Weasley says was actually once a moat is magical, and you can't get rid of the water in it? Interesting. Very, very interesting. Narcissa and Charlie are here now as well. They're like looking after the kids. It's all very nice. And after interacting with her a bit, Ron admits that maybe Draco sucks, but Narcissa is pretty cool. We're going to be hitting a bit of a lull in the narrative, and there's just going to be a bunch of vignettes that kind of set things up for the rest of the story, so bear with me. Ron goes over to Hermione and is like, oh, here's that book you wanted. I read through this chapter and the one before it quite a number of times. Hermione didn't ask for a book before this point. The book is entitled Lives of the Hogwarts Founders. Hermione is interested in what the historical record has to say about the relationship between Marina and Salazar, and wants to examine parallels she's seeing between Voldemort and Salazar as well. The next morning, Harry and Draco have a conversation. 
Drake was like, are you sure you want to be near me? Like, I did try to kill you last night. And Harry's like, well, do you feel like killing me now? And he's like, well, not really. And so Harry's like, I'm sure it's fine. In this scene, Harry learns that Draco also visited Snape, and he's immediately like, tell me everything. He must have some fucked up little secret. Does he like dressing up as a woman? I am not kidding. That is not me, like, exaggerating. That is exactly what Harry asks. It's really disgusting. Draco and Hermione have a scene together. They kind of make up, so to speak. In this conversation, Draco does admit to Hermione that sometimes he dreams about her. Sometimes they're married. Sometimes... They have children. Sometimes he dreams about wanting to hurt her and he hates those dreams. Two nights ago I dreamed that I was ill and that you came to see me, and I told you that nobody had sent me, said Hermione slowly, her voice falling into a dreamlike cadence. You said that you let a snake bite you on purpose. She's had the same dream. I don't know what this, like, means because I don't think it's ever followed up on. Then she's like, Draco, you need to tell me everything that's been going on with you. She starts taking notes about it. This includes telling her about the trip to the afterlife and meeting the founders, by the way. And this is when Hermione begins to theorize. Rowena said they needed to find the founders' keys, and she's got a really strong feeling that the Lycanth, the, like, silver cross necklace, is one of them. She's got it with her right now. She also knows for a fact now I guess from her research that Rowena Ravenclaw is the one who made the necklace. It stands to reason that maybe that's one of the keys, even though, like, Salazar had it. Whatever. Anyways, Jenny then has a conversation with Ron. She wants to go and investigate the cellars a bit. She has a bit of a theory of her own. She asks Ron if he wants to go with her. He's like, no, I don't want to. There are spiders. The reason that Jenny wants to go and take a look down there is because of just everything that's been going on and a lot of the stuff that she's hearing now. Hermione did mention that that tapestry of Helga Hufflepuff she saw looked a lot like Mrs. Weasley. Also, Mr. Weasley is convinced that there used to be a castle where the burrow is now. <laughs> There's just miles of tunnels and things down there that no one's even bothered to look into for hundreds of years. Remember when George found that spear thing and Dad said it dated back to one of the first goblin rebellions? I am resisting the urge to go off on this, but we are so close to the perfect moment to talk about it, so let's just keep going. Sirius, meanwhile, has gone to Gringotts. He finds, like, the thing that James was talking about, and he opens up the case that it's in, and he's like, What? We don't find out what it is just yet. He's also brought a St. Mungo's doctor over to Malfoy Manor to have a look at Lupin, who is now entirely turned into a werewolf. And the doctor's just kind of like, eh, that's weird. Couldn't tell you. Ron and Draco have a bonding moment of their own, finally. Ron teaches Draco how to play wizard chess, and Ron actually beats him a few times, and that really helps. They bet on the games. It's, it's fun. It's cute. At the end of this day where all this happens, Sirius apparates to like a field near the burrow and Narcissa operates there too and they are talking and then Narcissa looks up and screams and Sirius turns. The burrow's on fire. That ends chapter 9. It was 75 pages. Much of it not too important really in the long run. Sirius takes off. He runs towards the burrow. He finds everyone like on the ground. Charlie appears to be dead. Um, Draco and Harry are gone and I'm just gonna save you like 15 pages of this shit. Salazar, Slytherin, and Wormtail appeared in the burrow. There was a big fight. They kidnapped Draco and Harry. It seemed weirdly like Charlie was helping them. Draco and Harry are gone. And also, when Salazar got a look at Ginny, he referred to her as Helga. Interesting, right? Or not. I don't know. I've, I've been reading this for so long, I've lost track of what's actually engaging. Hermione thinks something was kind of off about Charlie, and then she looks at, like, the Weasleys, like, weird family clock thing, remember that? Charlie's hand is just at work. She runs over to the fire, she throws some flu powder in, Charlie's face appears, that wasn't Charlie. They look over at the body, and it's turned into just some guy. It's the most pointless of cop-outs. I hate it. Draco and Harry wake up in like a nice room, but it has no doors or windows. They're back in Salazar's like castle place thing. They're looking around. There is a cupboard in this room for some reason. Draco opens it and is like, hey, Harry, Salazar brought you a present. It's the Sword of Gryffindor. Salazar's brought it to the castle for some reason. We then have some more awkward sexual tension between the two of them. Harry's been like cussing out Draco a bit, and then Draco's like, this is turning into quite an ode to our relationship, Potter. Keep it up. I'm feeling all tingly. Harry settled into a sulk. That's probably just residual chafing from the leather trousers. Those fucking trousers, said Draco irritably. 
I have a feeling that nobody's ever going to let me forget them, even though I only wore them once, even though it was against my will. I feel like this is just Draco Malfoy, the character, talking to us, the audience. Harry snorted. Now I'm imagining Charlie holding you down and forcing the leather trousers onto you. Hey, that's your pervy little fantasy potter, not mine. This keeps going. I'm just thinking that perhaps my hair isn't the only thing around her that isn't actually straight. Pah! Draco batted Harry's hand away with an annoyed grunt. You are a Philistine. You know nothing. At least I'm not in denial, said Harry, and handed Draco the last piece of chocolate. Draco accepted it with a disdainful look. Me? Gay? Draco Malfoy? I should probably mention now, and I know this for a fact because of the last video I did about Cassandra Clare, in the time between chapters 9 and 10, Cassie began to speculate about whether or not she should include some explicit slash stuff in the Draco trilogy. I guess Cassie was like, well, I can't explicitly make them a couple because they're stepbrothers, which is surprising. I didn't think that'd stop her. But I guess because of that, she was just like, I'm just gonna give the gays jack fucking shit. It's certainly not heterosexual, whatever it is, I'll say that much. They notice that the room they're in is coated in that adamanting stuff, the practically indestructible stuff. They're bored, so uh, Draco's got his sword, Harry's got his own sword, they start fencing. But then all of a sudden, a door appears, and there's a figure in the door, and it approaches them, and they recognize who it is. And the figure goes, Hello, you stupid boys. It's floor and decor. Back at the burrow, which I guess wasn't that on fire because they just keep acting like it's not been destroyed. Mr. and Mrs. Weasley are back, Charlie's come back home, and Mad-Eye Moody is here as well. Mad-Eye figures out that the guy who they all thought was Charlie was actually some guy who was glamoured to look like Charlie, and he also identifies him as a werewolf. Remember, werewolves are magical creatures. Magical creatures are being called right now. This person was definitely under the control of Salazar Slytherin. Hermione is still thinking about, like, Salazar calling Ginny Helga and all that, and about how the quarry seems to be enchanted, and she decides she wants to head down to the cellars. Because the cellars apparently go on for miles, they are going to go underneath the quarry at some point, and she wants to know what's under there. Hermione talks to Ginny about this, Ginny ropes Ron into going down there with them, and they head off to the cellars. Ron's being a little fraidy cat because there's like spiders and shit down there. And then, all of a sudden, they hit a dead end, and they notice it's like all of a sudden really wet, like the ceiling is dripping, and Hermione is positive that they're under the quarry now. They're about to give up, but then Hermione's like, look at that etching on the wall there. And it's kind of covered up in dust, so like one of them like, brushes it away, and they see an etching of a badger, and also what looks like writing. Ron takes a look at it, and he thinks it's gibberish. Hermione can't really decipher it, but Ginny can. She reads it out loud. When there is fire in me, then I am still cold. When I own your true love's face, then you will not see me. To all things I give no more than I am given. In time I may have all things, and yet I can keep nothing. Hermione expelled her breath in amazement. It's a riddle, she said. Hermione pauses, she thinks it over. It's a mirror. And the moment she says that, the wall just starts to glow, and it turns into another passageway. There's another illustration of this happening, it's very nice. Anyways, I'm sure you're wondering what the hell was going on with Floor, like why is she in Salazar's castle? Harry and Draco are also wondering that, and they're kind of like debating it telepathically, and Floor is like, it is rude to talk behind other people's backs, because she's also a magid, so she can hear their telepathic talk. Floor looks angrily at Malfoy. It's not very nice to give someone a gift that just disappears. Draco's eyes flashed. It wasn't a gift, you extorted it for me. You owed me, and now you still do. Remember what I said about Floor getting the sword? Also, Draco wants to know how Floor was able to find them. She explains that she's here to rescue them. She was able to get into the castle by just pretending to be another Vila who'd been called. But she's imagined, so she can actually resist the call, unlike her sisters or her cousins or whoever those people were. She then holds out an emerald, and she says she took that off the sword, and she used that to track them. Using that, she was able to track the sword, and thus was able to track where Draco went. Except, earlier she said she was able to track Draco because the two of them had made a deal, and that was like ancient magic. And she's saying that the deal hasn't been followed through on. She didn't need, like, an emerald from the sword to track him. Also, I didn't remember anything about an emerald being on the sword, so I did like a control F search in the PDF. I looked for gem, jewel, emerald, anything like that. This is the first time it's been mentioned. Floor's like, I'm not gonna let you die when you still owe me something. And I just want to remind you that the thing she's talking about is that she distracted Professor Lupin for like an hour while they snuck into his office. Anyways, she's like, follow me. Let's get you out of here. 
And so they creep on out of the room. Meanwhile, Severus Snape is hanging out at his home when he hears a knock at the door. And he opens it, and it's... Sirius Black. That is the end of chapter 10, and it was 64 pages. Chapter 11 begins. Sirius says he's here because he needs Snape's help, and the first thing that Snape does when he's faced with a desperate Sirius Black is to slam the door in his face. Hermione and company are still trudging down through these ancient corridors. She's babbling on about the founders. It's kind of like a maze down there, but Ginny's guiding them. She says that she can, like, tell where to go. She can feel herself being pulled in certain directions. Meanwhile, Draco and Harry are also wandering around corridors with Floor. I feel like I'm watching an episode of classic Doctor Who right now. There's just so much wandering around corridors. They take a moment to like whisper while she walks on ahead to debate on whether or not they can trust her. Harry thinks they should. Draco thinks they shouldn't. There's another picture of the three of them in the castle at this point. They come to a door that they're pretty sure will lead them to the outside, so they open it up. And they go to the courtyard, and Fleur is like, follow me, darts across the courtyard. Before they can get through that door, um, for some reason it talks and they have to convince it to open. I think it's a bit that Cassandra Clare stole from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but I'm not sure. It seemed familiar enough at the very least. While all that corridor wandering and subterfuge is happening, Snape is busy being really smug about being really mean to Sirius Black. Ask a band. That had stopped Sirius's laughing shut up his laughter forever. Sometimes Snape dreamed about Sirius in Azkaban. His laughter shattered forever into screams like bright shards of glass, and there was some pleasure in that imagining, but also a gnawing sort of darkness. Fucking Severus Snape. I hate Severus Snape. I understand what Joanne was trying to do with the character, like, he's someone who's really unpleasant, but he's on the side of the good guys, and so that has a lot of value, and blah 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 blah. And here's the thing, just because Snape is on the side of the good guys doesn't make him a good person. I know that at this point book seven hadn't been released yet, and we didn't get the worst redemption story ever for him, but this guy sucks, I'm sorry. In the books, Snape takes out his anger and his trauma on literal children. He is Neville's boggart in book three. There's a scene in another book where he poisons Neville's toad and forces him to make the antidote just to prove that Neville is cheating because he knows he won't be able to do it without Hermione's help. He is constantly insulting and bullying his students. There's a bit in book four where Draco's cast a spell on Hermione and her teeth have exploded and he's like, oh, I don't see any difference, even though they're like giant beaver teeth now. And she literally starts to sob because he says that. And on top of that, in book three, he wants to lock a man up in Azkaban because he used to bully him. I hate this man, and it's insane that Harry named one of his children after him. The best way this story could have gone was for Harry to realize that even though he was on the side of the good guys, Dumbledore was wrong to trust him. He shouldn't have been a teacher. I guarantee any positive associations you have with Snape as a character is totally down to the movies and Alan Rickman's portrayal of him. It has nothing to do with how he's depicted in the books. Anyways, in the amount of time it's taken for me to vent about this, Snape has had a moment to reconsider and he's gone back to the door and opened it up. Sirius explains what's happened to Lupin. He's hoping that Snape will be able to find a way to cure this. Snape pauses and is like, hmm. Very well. Because in this story, at least, he's going to be the bigger person. Just this once. Anyways, Harry, Draco, and Floor have now entered the courtyard, and it is filled with monsters, and Floor is like, they must fight them in order to get across the courtyard. They have to fight some shapeshifters. They stumble into nightmare grass, which is another thing that Cassandra Clare stole from the Hidden Land. They run across the courtyard. Floor directs them into her tower. They're running through the tower. Harry forces them to stop because they've lost Floor. They turn around and they see that she's being menaced by a bunch of guards. I guess by this point, Salazar summoned enough dark creatures that he has, like, guards and people protecting him and stuff like that. In a different corridor, Ron has stumbled and fallen into a pit of mud, and he crawls out of it and he pulls something out, and it's an ancient coin. This ancient coin has a picture of Godric Gryffindor on it, and Ron is like, man, I really wish Harry was here. I bet he'd love to have a coin that has his face on it. Like, I'm sure he'd find that hilarious. And like, hang on. For this entire story, they keep saying that these kids look a lot like the founders, but the first time Salazar was introduced, it's also stated that Hogwarts is filled with portraits and statues of them. How has no one ever noticed the similarities up until now? If it's that striking that you can see it on a coin, it must be pretty obvious. Whatever. 
they keep stumbling through the maze and then they come to another brick wall with another riddle on it. To be gold is to be good, to be stone is to be nothing, to be glass is to be fragile, to be cold is to be cruel. Ginny figures it out, she etches a heart onto the stone with her wand, starts to glow, and then a brick in the wall shifts and falls out down and there's like a hidden enclave on inside of it. There's a box inside of that enclave. Ginny grabs the box and is immediately just like, this is mine. She's like acting very possessive over this box. They open up the box and they look inside and you know what's inside the box? A time turner. Meanwhile, while all that was happening, Harry and Draco were able to rescue Flora and they are still on their way. While that is happening, I know so much jumping around. I'm sorry, I didn't write it. Not my fault. Snape is working on the potion. He thinks it'll work. They're like kind of bonding. It's kind of awkward though. Sirius wants to thank Snape, but he says that the image of you trying to force that potion down the throat of a half-crazed werewolf is really all the thanks I need. And with that, Sirius heads back to Malfoy Manor. Back at the burrow, Ron, Ginny and Hermione have gone back upstairs. They've shown the time turner to Charlie, who's having it looked at by Aurors, who are like swarming all over the house because, you know, Salas are just attacked. There's nothing else super important in this scene, but we do get to find out that Ron found some of Fred and George's magazines. Meanwhile, back at Salazar's castle, three of them come to a door that is covered in adamantine. It seems to be sealed shut. Floor says that this will lead them to the outside and they can get out of here. The thing is, is that it seems like it's going to need some magic powers to be opened. It's locked. Not just any magic, probably combined magic powers. So they start to consider what if Harry and Draco kiss one another, and that rush of power will be enough to open the door. I'm not kidding. Harry raised an eyebrow. You're not going to kiss me, are you? Draco grinned slowly. I might. I really think you should, Floor said. He's a much more powerful magic than I am. Desperate time, said Draco, and took a step toward Harry. Shut your eyes, Potter. It'll all be over in a second. I'm not going to shut my eyes, Harry began indignantly. So you like to kiss with your eyes open? Kinky that, said Draco cheerfully, and grabbed Harry by the front of the shirt. Harry rolled his eyes. All right then, get it over with. If you think kissing with your eyes open is kinky, I deeply, deeply pity you. They then decide to not kiss and they just kind of like hold their hands and concentrate. That doesn't work. And Draco starts to think, well, the last time I needed to get a burst from Harry, I had to make him really angry. So he starts telling Harry about how he, when he died, he went to the afterlife and he saw his parents in the afterlife. He's saying this with like a really smug expression on his face and Harry's like, stop it, you're lying. Oh no, I'm not Potter. Yes, you are. No, I'm not Potter. Just kind of winding him up. This is going to be like a big deal that he told Harry this because like James and Lily said, to learn this may actually deeply hurt Harry, and it's certainly enough to make him angry enough to open the door, I'll say that much. Hermione, in the burrow that evening, is holding onto the lycanth, and then all of a sudden she feels a kind of prickle and tugging. It's pulling her down the stairs to the box that was left on the table with the time turner in it. Ron is downstairs as well, and they start to talk. Hermione really wants a glance at the time turner, and she examines it, and she starts to exposit. There are two kinds of time turners according to her. One of them is the kind that she had when she was in third year. You could turn it a few times and it could take you to a variety of points in the past, depending on like how you set it. But there's another kind which sends you to a very specific point in time. The further back you go, the less precise it can be, but that's the kind of time turner that this is even though this is going to be contradicted later in the story. Oh, before this, Hermione was having a dream where she saw the founders make the time turner. I forgot to mention it in my notes until this point, so sorry. Because of that dream, Hermione knows that they made this specifically so their heirs could find it if Salazar Slytherin ever returned. And like, the timeline here confuses me a lot. They say that Salazar used special magics to seal himself away, but they also say that he killed all the founders except for Rowena. And I just don't quite understand like what order that all happened in. It, it's very unclear, like was he sealed away and then he came back and then was he like sent back to the dark dimension wherever he was? Why did he seal himself away if he successfully killed everyone? Was it to escape the demons who he made a pact with? I don't know, and I just, we're gonna go with it. I just, I needed to point it out, and we're just gonna keep going now. Hermione is convinced that the founder set this time turner to take the heirs, 
back to the time of the founders, you know, so the founders can talk to them directly and all information that is needed can be communicated. Hermione is all set to go back herself, but Ron refuses. He's like, absolutely the fuck not. I am definitely coming with you. Hermione also says at this point that getting back to the present after you go that, that far back in time is very risky, so she doesn't want to risk any more people than is necessary. She also says that she can feel new powers surging through her from the Lycanth. It's magid level power, in fact. She's also a magid now, essentially, as long as she has the Lycanth with her. They bicker some more, they decide that they are going to go back in time together. Hermione takes the time turner, wraps it around the two of their necks, she twists it, and nothing happens. But before we can figure out why that didn't work, we cut back to Malfoy Manor. Sirius has been able to give Lupin the potion, he is now human, but he's also retaining his memories from when he was being called, and he now knows where Salazar Slytherin is. Back at Salazar Slytherin's castle, Harry, Draco, and Floor go through the door. It's not to the outside of the castle, it's just this room, and in this room is a monster. It's a manticore. And once the manticore appears, Floor is just like, bye, and she walks out the door, and the door behind them vanishes. So they are just stuck in this circular room with no way out, with a monster. Harry and Draco fight it very dramatically. They're able to kill it. That's the main thing. And once they do, the door appears and Floor reappears. And with her is Salazar Slytherin. Salazar's like, oh, I'm so glad you killed it. That's why I brought you here. He's got like a very pleased smile on his face while he says this. Meanwhile, at the burrow, Ron and Hermione have looped in Ginny and she's like, well, duh, of course it didn't work. Why did you try to use it without me? I'm clearly connected to it. They do it again, wrap it around their necks. Ginny takes it, she flips it over and the world falls out beneath them and they're just like, Wah! They're surrounded by mist flying through time. And for a brief moment, Hermione thinks she sees Harry sitting in a blue cell. Adamantine can look blue in like a high concentration of it. Meanwhile, back at Salazar's castle, Harry and Draco are in a blue cell and, and Harry for a moment thinks he sees Hermione. Floor explains that because Hermione didn't work out as Salazar's source, she has volunteered to be it instead, which should work better because it's been established that Magids can only use another Magid as their source and it seems like she has somehow consented to this being the case. Do you think, said the Snake Lord, that when you refuse to serve me, I would not find another to take your place? And she's almost as cute as you are. You know, I don't want to dwell on this, so let's just go to the next scene, okay? So I know that I said that both of them killed it, but mainly Draco was the one who killed it. He landed the killing blow. This is also why Salazar stole the Gryffindor sword, it's so Harry also could have a chance to kill the Manticore. And Salazar's like, since you are my heir, and you killed the Manticore for me, come with me, I shall reward you. As for the Gryffindor boy, send him back to the adamantine cell. And so ends chapter 11, which was 62 pages. Gotta be honest, very long, but after the last two chapters, this was a lot more exciting. On to chapter 12. Charlie makes up in the middle of the night, he's hungry, he goes down to the kitchen, and he's like making his food or whatever, and he just kind of glances at like the Weasley family clock. The Ginny and Ron hands are just kind of spinning wildly around the clock. They're not pointing at any of the like quote-unquote times, and that's because, you know, they're not in the present anymore. Hermione felt herself shot backward as if hurled from a cannon, everything spinning away behind her into gray mist. She, Ginny, and Ron land, they're all kind of like scattered across where they landed. So they kind of pick themselves up, dust themselves off, look around. They seem to be in what looks like the ruins of an old castle. I'm just wondering where everyone is. Why would the Turner be set to bring us back to a place where everything is destroyed? We must have arrived after the battle with Salazar. So yeah, I guess all the flashbacks we've been getting up to this point have been from the big battle between all the founders. Or I imagine three of the founders versus Salazar. They then hear a voice that goes, look, survivors, and they turn, and it's this, like, little kid. It was Harry, only it wasn't Harry as he was now, not the almost 17-year-old Harry who even now scared her a little with his grown-upness, and the fact that occasionally, not that often, he needed to shave. This was Harry as he had been the first time she'd seen him, small and skinny and eleven, with his dark green eyes the biggest feature of a face still round with the last vestiges of childhood. This guy, who they're meeting, this little kid, I should say, is Godric's son. This is Godric's son, by the way. It's a picture of, like, a very young Daniel Radcliffe, and there's another one next to him of a grown-up Daniel Radcliffe, and I'll get to why 
later. Anyways, Godric's son is like, oh, you must be the heirs. I guess they noticed that, like, they were dressed funny or whatever. Anyways, Sirius and Lupin have decided to go to Godric's Hollow. I forgot to mention, because I didn't care. The thing that Sirius found in the Green God's Vault in that box was a key, and he thinks whatever the key goes to is going to be something hidden in like the hiding place he and James had, and the rest of the Marauders, it seems, when they were kids. So he and Lupin parade off. Also, when Sirius was at Snape's house, he asked to borrow a book titled Demons, Demons, Demons. He's left it there, and Narcissa is now looking at it. The name Demons, Demons, Demons is the name of a book from, I think, a Discworld novel. Editing David just quickly jumping in here to let you know that it is not a joke taken from a Discworld novel. It is a joke taken from an episode of Angel, the Buffy the Vampire spinoff. Regardless, it's not her original joke. Just letting you know. Jumping from Godric's Hollow, to Salazar's castle. Draco's now like hanging out in a room with Floor. Apparently because there's like that prophecy about how Salazar and his heir are destined to rule side by side, he is now pretending to get along with Salazar. He's pretending to be on the bad guy's side. And apparently Salazar wanted Draco and Harry to kill the manticore because there was something hidden in its belly that he desperately needs. But at the moment, anyways, Draco and Floor are in this room alone together and they kind of have a moment. Floor claims she didn't know what was going to be in that room and that she had no choice. She has to work for Salazar. It wasn't for me that I did what I did. It was for my little sister, for Gabrielle. And Drake was like, ha, I don't believe you. I am done with your lies. Meanwhile, in medieval times. <laughs> the kid who looks like Harry, who is Godric's son, introduces himself as Benjamin, and he's like, come on, follow me. He takes off across the battlefield, and they follow him. The Snake Lord created an army of goblins, shapeshifters, and hybrid half-man creatures. The whole wizarding world was drawn into the battle. On our side, we had the giants, unicorns, and the dwarves. He paused and glanced around him at the wreckage. This was Hufflepuff Castle, he said. What wasn't burned to the ground by Dragonfire was destroyed in the aftermath of the curse. What curse? Hermione demanded. Rowena will explain that to you, said Benjamin, as they came around a corner of a broken wall and out into the sunlight and open spaces. On the way to the camp, they passed over the remains of what had been a moat and would one day be the Weasley's quarry. Pause. Just, just pause. We're not recapping the story now. I've been alluding to my dislike for this whole air idea since it was introduced, and I think this is a good time to talk about why. And unfortunately, in order to do so, I am going to have to talk about some of the plot and themes of Harry Potter itself. In Harry Potter, the villain's main motivation is his obsession with wizarding bloodlines. The idea that pure blood wizards, wizards who come from wizarding families, are the only ones who are worthy of being wizards, and anyone who comes from a muggle family or who doesn't have magical powers is worthless and should be killed. So essentially what Joanne has done here very loosely is taken a very rough understanding of the British class system and has kind of turned that into this really weird magical allegory for bigotry. British nobility is also obsessed with continuing bloodlines. You look at someone like the Malfoy family, who are great allies to Voldemort. They are an ancient family, apparently, and excessively wealthy. And then you contrast that with, say, the Weasleys, who are so poor that I think when Harry first comes to the burrow, it's described as looking like a pigsty that has had like a bunch of magical floors added on top of it. They are dirt poor and they are meant to be the good guys. And then we have someone like Hermione who is from a non-wizarding family who is very much othered by this system. So to say that Hermione, for whom one of her biggest traits is that she doesn't come from a wizarding family, to say that actually way, way back, there are wizards in her bloodline, just kind of flies in the face of the metaphor. Same thing with the Weasleys, they're meant to just be random wizards. They are lovely random wizards, but like, they are meant to contrast with the Malfoys, I feel. To say that they are super, super ancient and they are still living on like, their ancient royal family grounds or whatever is bizarre. It just doesn't seem right. I find this really funny too because in book six and seven it becomes very clear that Voldemort himself is obsessed with the founders and he like worships them as this idea. Again, Voldemort's meant to be the bad guy and that is likely meant to demonstrate how his obsession with wizarding bloodlines is bad. I know people talk about how Rowling is just weirdly obsessed with bloodlines or blah blah blah, blah but her books are attempting 
to critique this system. They don't do it very well, but that is the intention. So to see a fanfic writer just not understand that thematically is very strange to me. It feels like it's flying in the face of what little depth Harry Potter has. I just don't like it. It feels really weird. And now that I've acknowledged it and talked about it, we can continue with the story. Rowena is going to be dying soon, by the way, which is why Ben is in such a hurry. Back in the present of the 90s, Sirius and Lupin are at Godric's Hollow. They're trying to figure out where this hidden box may be. And I will say one nice thing. It does seem like Cassandra Clare really liked the Marauders era of Hogwarts. Whenever uh, Sirius or Lupin are talking to one another, you can tell there's a lot of affection there. There's a lot of long history. And when it's not taking away from the tension or whatever, it's it's nice. I don't think she shipped Wolfstar, which is the name of their ship name. I don't get any kind of shippy vibes from the two of them, but she clearly liked their dynamic and I can appreciate that. Sirius goes over to a tree in Godric's Hollow. I guess it's like in the front yard or whatever. And this apparently used to be like the Marauder's hiding place. And he reaches his hand into like the hollow hole thing in the tree. And he's like pulling out stuff. Some of the objects were familiar. Lupin recognized with a pang the box of Zonko's magical reality pencils. Make your sketches come to life that had been used to draw the Marauder's map. A stack of letters. He hadn't seen them before, but he recognized Lily's handwriting. Sirius brushed a hand over those and set them aside. Remember the Zonko's magic pencils. They will come up later. But there's no locked box. And then Sirius thinks, wait, what if it's buried under the tree? Points his wand and goes, Accio. And then he tells Lupin, duck. And Lupin ducks down because a shovel flies right over his head. He could have died. Draco and Floor are still in that nice room. Salazar has joined them. Salazar thinks he has finally gotten through to Draco. As I mentioned, Draco's pretending to be on his side now. Or at the very least, he's kind of given in. It's, it's, it's unclear at the moment. I won't call you master, said Draco evenly. Slytherin seemed unruffled. I would not expect you to. Draco narrowed his eyes. What would you like me to call you? Soon enough, said Slytherin. You will call me father. Yeah, you know, that word doesn't really have very good associations for me. Maybe I could call you something else, like Nigel? Something friendly. Slytherin smiled. After this evening, you may feel differently. Do you know what I have planned? I was hoping for a night at the opera, maybe some flowers, then we take a walk under the stars, you make move. I tell you I'm not that kind of guy. All of that's from Draco. The homoeroticism of this exists. Salazar's then like, all right, boy. Come over to me, give me your arm. Potestastum patris nostre in tenebris invoco, his Slytherin, sounding almost like Harry speaking parcel tongue. And suddenly the chalk circle flared into flames, a ring of fire burning around them. Slytherin grinned, and this time there was a mirth in his smile and a light in his eyes, although that could have just been the reflection of the fire. Brucchiatura, he cried. I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation, but somehow I am sure someone in the comments will find a way to tell me that it's wrong. Piercing horrific pain shoots through Jaco's arm. He's in agony, and when it's over, he opens his eyes, and he looks down at his arm. He has the dark mark now. Anyways, jumping back to the dying woman in a tent in medieval times, Ron, Ginny, and Hermione and Ben have made it to Rowena's tent. Rowena is lying in her bed. She looks at Hermione is like, oh, so there's to be another one of me out there in the world one day. She also says that Ginny looks an awful lot like Helga. She also says that this meeting is heirs only, so Ron just has to wait outside like a little kid. <laughs> Rowena is really happy to see that Hermione got the lycanth. That is her key, after all. And she starts to expose it a bit. She says that Salazar is probably looking for the orb. His powers I drained into an orb, and because I could not destroy it, I hid it away where it would be protected by the fiercest monster Salazar himself had ever created. So if he were to rise again, he would be weak and powerless. Unless, she added, he can get the orb back. She doesn't think he'd be ever able to kill a manticore though, which Ruh -ruh. But if he did, said Hermione, if he did kill the Manticore, and if he had the orb, then what? The orb can only be opened in the presence of all four heirs. Each must touch it and speak an opening charm, and they must do so by choice. Words spoken under the Imperious Curse would be ineffective. Does Slytherin know that? No, but he's clever. He knows me as well. He heard the charm I spoke that imprisoned him in the first place. Given time, he could work it out. Okay, so, again, confused about the timeline here. Salazar claimed that he, like, hid himself away until... The time was right for him to return or whatever the fuck. Now Rowena is saying that she and the other hares sealed him away. But also Salazar killed Helga Hufflepuff and Godric Gryffindor. So again, 
what was the timeline here? It seems like they just defeated him, so presumably they just sealed him away. So when does the killing of Godric Gryffindor and Helga Hufflepuff take place? Maybe Helga Hufflepuff died of natural causes, but I'm not seeing Godric anywhere. They tell her that, yes, there is also a Slytherin heir in their time. They say that his name is Draco Malfoy, and for some reason she flinches when they say his name. She is worried that he will inevitably side with Slytherin because of the prophecy that everyone keeps going on about. Salazar has a way, said Rowena, of not leaving much of any choice. What matters to him, to Draco? What's the most important thing in the world to him? She asked Hermione. Hermione almost smiled. Besides himself? She thought for a moment. Harry. Tears suddenly prickled the back of her eyelids. Oh, so... She thinks that Harry is the most important person or thing in the world to him. Interesting. Interesting. By which I mean that is extremely gay. I, do, I know that they're going to be stepbrothers soon, but can they just kiss? Like, I know that would be gross, but it wouldn't be that out of line for Cassandra Clare to have them kiss, right? I feel like if they kissed, it would stop a lot of the problems that they're having with their relationship. You know? Is it just me? Am I being weird? Hermione also mentions now, like, that flash of Harry she got while they were traveling back in time in, like, the cell. The cell is made out of adamantine, and adamantine and very... This is when Rowena begins to speculate, because she knows that there is a cell in Salazar's castle that is an awful lot like that. And so Rowena is like, all right, go to the castle, Benjamin will show you the way, and then use the time turner to go back to the present. Benjamin! She, like, calls out. Benjamin comes in, and Ron follows. And then all of a sudden, Rowena pauses and takes another look at Ron. Come here, said Rowena to him, and held out a hand. Looking even more curious, he obeyed. Hermione watched as he crossed the room to the bed, his hands shoved in his pockets, eyebrows raised. You're a diviner, said Rowena, without preamble, looking closely at him. A seventh son. Ron jerked his hands out of his pockets in astonishment. A what? A diviner. Are they not common in your time? Hermione felt her mouth drop open. But Ron hates divination. He must not have had proper teaching then, said Rowena serenely. Remember, earlier in this book, earlier in today's recording, in fact, um, Ron and Ginny revealed that there is another Weasley child who died when they were very young. So Ron is the seventh son of the family. And if you know anything about magic and any of that, a seventh son is always going to be extra super special. It seems like he has not been trained at all, but with some training, he could be powerful. And power attracts danger. I'm so glad that at the very last second, Cassandra Clare has decided that Ron will be somewhat relevant to the story. Anyways, with that revelation, Ben and our time warp trio head on out to get to Salazar's castle. Does anyone else remember that, the time warp trio? It was a series of books, but I think it also had like a really short-lived PBS show, and I think it ended on a cliffhanger. Am I like misremembering that? Please someone tell me they remember this. I am wearing, for me, what is a rather showy tank top and some indecently tiny short shorts today. It is so hot in here, I will apologize for nothing. Elsewhere in the castle, Slytherin and Draco are having another talk. Salazar wants Draco to kill Harry. Draco's insisting it's not possible because Harry is charmed. Voldemort wasn't able to kill him as a baby and all that shit. They have like a very Darth Vader-y Luke Skywalker moment about, like, destiny or whatever. The covenant that holds the world together calls for opposites, the dark and the light, uniformity and chaos. Bodied and disembodied, each half needs the other to survive. Without demons, there would be no angels. Without Slytherin, there would be no Gryffindor. Without Draco Malfoy, no Harry Potter, said Draco flatly. I get it. I'm not stupid. I could make her love you he said, and Draco flinched. The love potion was unsatisfactory, I know, since she knew it was a falsity. It was intended as a punishment. But I could make her love you, and she would know no difference. Wait, 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 wait. Stop the action. Um, Cassie? Cassandra Clare? You're flagrantly contradicting yourself. The original plan on Salazar's part was for Hermione to fall in love with him. That was the whole idea. He was obsessed with the idea that this was Rowena returned to him or whatever. And he didn't care that it was a falsity before. He didn't know Draco was going to show up either. It's just kind of useful to him that he did, considering the whole prophecy and everything. And with that in mind, if he could make Hermione love him in a different way, in a way that wasn't so obviously fake, whatever that means, why didn't he do it? Anyways, Draco is again resisting 
being on Salazar's side. And so Salazar's like, all right, then. Salazar drags him into a room with a mirror in it, and he forces Draco to look into it, and he explains, this is the mirror of Erised's twin mirror. The mirror of Erised shows your heart's greatest desire. This shows you your worst traits. And he forces Draco to stare into it. When Draco is eventually let out of the room, he stumbles back to wherever Floor is, and he looks really fucked up. And Floor is like, oh, he showed you the mirror, didn't he? Floor has also summoned like a bunch of butterflies with her magic powers just to like amuse herself. And Draco very angstily uh, incinerates them with his powers. It's all very broody. Meanwhile, back at Malfoy Manor, Narcissa is flipping through that demon book and she finds a spell that'll allow her to banish a demon and send it back to hell. And she gets an idea. Also, Snape has shown up to help her, which is nice of him, I guess. They head down to the dungeons and they talk to the demon. Narcissa is positive that Salazar is going to kill either Draco or Harry, and Draco is her blood son, Harry's her stepson. She's extremely concerned, and she wants to know if there's a way to stop that. In the original bargain, Slytherin promised us a magic heir of his own blood, and that is what we will take, unless the Snake Lord can be persuaded to offer up the sword to us willingly with his own hand, in which case we will take him instead. Remember, the demons still want a blood debt of some kind, and that's presumably why Salazar is keeping Harry alive at the very least. Editing David here again. There's more to this particular scene with Narcissa and the demon later, but the way I described it was really incomprehensible, so I'm just going to um, summarize it here. Essentially, Narcissa's making a deal with the demon here where she can get some information, the information we just heard, uh, and in exchange she will send the demon back to hell because apparently the demon can't send himself back to hell and this demon's been just wandering the earth for like many many centuries ever since this deal was made with Salazar. She gets that information. The bit about the sword being returned with his hand is kind of important to the resolution of the story, but she never gets that information to the boys, so there's a bit of an inconsistency there. Besides that, this scene just does not go anywhere. It serves mainly to get rid of the demon who has just become like a dangling plot thread at this point. It is the only thing that Narcissa does. Most of the information in here is not new, and the boys don't learn it. A bit frustrating, but just wanted to give that some clarity. Meanwhile, weren't some characters like time traveling or something? Ginny and Hermione and Ron and Ben got to Salazar's castle. They went into the adamantine room. Ginny turned the time turner. They whooshed up to the present. As it happens, Harry's being kept in the adamantine cell, and all of a sudden, the three of them appear within it. Hermione rushes over to give Harry a big hug. The four of them exchange information. Ben didn't go with them, obviously. But then they hear footsteps, and they're like, shit, shit, shit. The three of them rush back under the cloak. Harry's just there out in the open. The door opens and it's Salazar and Draco. Before we can see the rest of that scene though, we're jumping again to Sirius, where is he? There he is, and Lupin who have unearthed a chest underneath that tree and they've opened it and they're like, what? That's the inheritance thing? It was long, as long as his arm and made of silver. The scabbard to a sword, engraved all over with brilliant designs of flowers and animals and leaves that flowed together intricately to form the word Gryffindor. It's the scabbard to Gryffindor's sword. Now that Draco has been forced to be tortured by the magic mirror, Salazar is convinced that he is all on his side, finally. And he walks out of the room and lets Harry and Draco have some alone time. And he is very proud of Draco right now. I mean? Yeah. I like mean. Yeah. I'm really mean yeah. too. Draco is kind of leaning into this. He is acting all smarmy and like nasty, taunting Harry. Hermione felt her heart sink down into her stomach. That smile. She hadn't seen that kind of smile on Draco's face in months. It was a nasty sort of childish, amused smile. Malfoy, said Harry. So quietly, Hermione had to strain to hear him. You don't have to do this. I'll die if I don't. Draco's voice was a monotone, and Hermione was struck by his choice of words. Not, he'll kill me if I don't, but I'll die. As if it was quite out of his control. Do you know what it's like to try and refuse a destiny, Potter? Do you know what you've done, Potter? You've taken everything away from me. If it weren't for you, my father would be alive. Draco is here to get some blood from Harry for some reason, and he takes the blood, he leaves, he uses Harry's pocket knife to do it, and then once he's gone, Hermione and company scramble out from under the cloak. Hermione is positive that Draco was just acting, but nobody else seems to think so. And then they notice something. Jenny's not there. And they're like, Jenny, 
You can come out from under the cloak, the coast is clear. But the thing is, Ginny isn't there anymore. She has scampered off underneath the invisibility cloak to follow Draco. In this moment as well, Harry realizes that there's now something in his pocket. When Draco was taking blood from him, he slipped something in there. It's his epicyclical charm. Here's an illustration of them discovering this. And with that illustration ends chapter 12. That was 83 pages. Draco is back in that room with Floor. He's acting all broody. It's like really sad, you guys. Like, Alexa, play Simple Plan. How could this happen to me? I've made my mistakes. Got nowhere to run. My heart goes on. That's like the vibe. He's also drinking a lot of Matis, Mai Tais, M-A-I space T-E-A. Two separate words. I looked up how to pronounce it and I've already forgotten, sorry. He then hears a sound from behind him and he turns around and it's Ginny. They're gonna have a conversation, but before we get to that, back to Sirius and Lupin, who are just like standing in the rain. Sirius is thinking this might be the key for the Gryffindor air. And then all of a sudden they see something fly towards them. They look up and it's Buckbeak. Back to the conversation between Draco and Ginny. Ginny tells him that Ron and Hermione are also there. Draco's kind of like, my current plan is to get very drunk and to wait to see if Harry decides to kill me. So far I have, but he hasn't, if that makes sense. It's more broody Draco. He just, he wants Harry to kill him with the epicyclical charm, presumably. Ginny is still trying to get through to him, but after looking into that magic mirror, Draco is just convinced he's pure monster. There's no way he can be a good person. This is what he's destined and doomed to be. Ginny ends up comparing him to Harry again, which pisses him off, and this somehow leads to them making out again. And this is when Full of Manure shows up and is like, Hello, are you quite finished yet? Fleur, after witnessing this, wants to know if Ginny can, and I quote, make Draco go boom boom. I'm really glad I read that. Buckbeak is flying the two of them. Uh, to get to Slytherin Castle, by the way. Narcissa is still going to be at home for the rest of the book. They go up to a door. They are greeted by the guardian of the door, who tells them to go to a side door. That door also talks. It's another bit Cassandra Clare is stolen from someone. I'm not sure if it's Hitchhikers this time or not. Lupin can get in quite easily because, you know, werewolf. Sirius, meanwhile, is pretending to be a vampire. They are greeted by a banshee after getting through that second door. The magic creatures are being segregated into separate dorms or something, so... Lupin's being taken to the werewolf dorm, and I guess no other vampires have shown up, so Banshee doesn't know what to do with Sirius just yet. It's the next morning. Floor ended up sleeping in the same room as Ginny and Draco. Draco wakes up first, then Floor, and Draco notices that Floor is looking really bad, like really weak, really sunken features or whatever. Floor explains that she is getting weaker. She is Salazar's source, but it's slowly killing her, even though we were explicitly told that only another magid could be a magid source. So presumably, like, she should be able to give enough power if she is somehow consenting to this relationship. It's all very abstract, I have to say. I'm a little lost on how this works. Ginny has vanished now, presumably under the visibility cloak. And then Draco is summoned to speak to Salazar. Now, I feel like by this point, you're probably kind of wondering. I mean, I guess it's sort of obvious. What is Salazar's like, end game here, you know? Like, yeah, get out of the demon pact, still have the sword, get back the source powers, and then what? Like, once he succeeded at all that, what's he gonna do? He is planning to take over the world, or England, or something, to kill all the mudbloods and the muggles, exact quote, which is weird because he is like, 2,000 years old or something. He shouldn't know the word muggle. There's no way that word is stuck around. That must be a relatively recent linguistic development. Just going off how slang works, it's unlikely that he'd know that term. And yes, that is a nitpick. And guess what? I don't care. He also then says that he never loved Rowena, which is just not true. He literally said that he was obsessed with her. He adored her. He explains that because he, Rowena was his source, she was always a part of him, and as such, he couldn't truly love her. But like, it... What is happening here? I don't know. I'm lost. Salazar leaves to talk to one of his minions. The minion has run some tests on Harry's blood and thinks that Salazar will find them interesting. I'm gonna wait and see if it comes up in my notes, but I did finish reading this relatively recently. I'm pretty sure this goes nowhere. So now Draco's alone for a little while, but not for too long, because then that banshee enters and with her is... Serious Black. You know, one of my favorite pieces of just writing, period, is My Immortal. It's also a Harry Potter fanfiction. It's generally considered the worst piece of fanfiction ever written. I think it is a 
at least in its first 15, 20 odd chapters, a brilliantly subtle troll fic that has a lot of thought put into it. One of the weird prose choices the author makes in that is that like every few chapters, maybe even more frequently than that, they'll be kind of like, well, anyway, I went there. Someone will show up and the prose will be like, it was dot 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 dot. Voldemort or whoever. This story has a really similar vibe to that. Like every time a character like appears before another one quite suddenly and it takes a moment for that character to recognize the other, it feels like one of those moments from My Immortal, like really trying hard to be melodramatic and just failing. I don't know, it's just got a similar vibe. Is anyone else is anyone else getting that from this? I maybe I'm projecting. The Banshee wants to know where to put Sirius. I guess they've been wandering around all night trying to figure out where to put him. Draco tells the Banshee to leave the two of them alone. He wants to talk to this vampire by himself. Before we see that conversation, um, Ginny is back in that bedroom with Floor. There's not a lot to this conversation, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. Floor says that the girl she met in her fourth year is no longer the girl she sees now, two years later. Again, it's just Cassandra Clare patting herself on the back for making Ginny interesting. We get a bit more depth to Floor and why she's doing this as well. Long story short, her little sister Gabrielle is A, a squib, B, like really sick with something, and it requires a very powerful sorcerer to help. She's doing this because she thinks Salazar will be able to help her little sister. But like, wasn't the little sister her captive in the second task in book four? Isn't putting someone who is ill, and ill in a way that is somehow magical, under a spell and put underwater to act as a victim kind of terrible, even if there was no way they were going to die? Which, to be fair, for Hogwarts seems about par for the course now that I say it aloud. Back to Draco and Sirius. The first thing Draco does now that they're alone is that he grabs a spear and points it threateningly at Sirius, very dramatically. Sirius, much like everyone else, really wants to help Draco and he mentions that he's got Gryffindor's key and that's when Draco screams for the Banshee to come and take Sirius away and into a cell. Do you see what I did there? banshee scream. It's not that funny, I know. And yes, his actions are evil, but still Sirius sees something in the boy's eyes, something which whispers, trust me. Just to recap for a moment, we have a magic scabbard, we have the magic silver crossed lycanth, we have the magic time turner, we have currently two different orbs which were a part of the narrative, we have two separate epicyclical charms, we also have Salazar Slytherin's sword. There's also a subplot I've not really been talking about concerning the potion that Snape made to help Draco resist the will of Slytherin, which is kind of floating around. I think Lupin's got some of it right now. This is a lot of just magic stuff. In fact, it's just too much magic stuff. It's a very cluttered narrative, and it's a very unfocused narrative as well, as I'm sure you've noticed, and all of this stuff does not help. And there's so many scenes where these characters just fuss about these items, and the entire plot just draws to a standstill. It's awful. Draco goes back to the bedroom that Floor and Ginny are in. Ginny is gone again. She has slipped off and away in, under the invisibility cloak again. Actually, no, I take that back. She didn't take the invisibility cloak this time. She left it in the room. Draco takes it, and he sneaks down to Harry's cell and is like, we need to go find Ginny. A bunch of us can fit under the cloak. She's somewhere in the castle. We have to find her. If you're thinking, now that Draco and Ron are in the same room again, that Ron is just screaming at Draco and calling him a traitor again, you would be right. After some more arguing, they head on off to find Ginny, but I don't think they're going to have much luck in doing so, because Ginny has slipped off and away into some private part of the castle and has turned the time turner over again. She's back in time again, she heads out of the castle, she looks around, she all of a sudden sees that there's tons of tents everywhere, and the colors of the tents tell her that these are Gryffindor's people, these are his soldiers, so I guess they're like red and yellow or whatever. She runs into the camp, which is I guess not very well guarded. She stumbles onto a man who is sitting on a stool outside a tent, and the man is like, who are you? This person is Ben, again. She didn't go back as far this time, he is now older. Which is why I have two separate pictures of Daniel Radcliffe right next to one another on the board. Harry and company are stumbling around the castle. Hermione claims that the different keys can track one another, so she's trying to use her lycanth to track Ginny's time turner, and of course it's not working. And then they stumble onto Wormtail, who is in a cell. Remember, 
Wormtail kind of panicked and bailed after it seemed like Draco had died. I guess this is his punishment. Wormtail feels like super betrayed by Salazar. He tells them, if you can get the orb, the orb that Salazar's been after, and take its power, you might have a chance against him. He tells them what room it's in, they head on off, they turn around a corner and walk right into a bunch of guards. A little while later, they are back in a cell. Their rescue attempt did not last very long at all, I have to say. Harry and Draco are in a cell. Ron and Hermione are on their own in the separate cell. This gives our characters yet another moment to talk. Draco says sorry, which if you remember from very, very early on in the last video is like a huge growth moment for him because he never says sorry. Harry does not accept Draco's apology. He's still really angry about all this shit that they've been going through and about Draco telling Harry about seeing his parents after he died. Then Harry is able to work through it because Draco lets Harry punch the ever-living shit out of him. I don't know if Cassandra Clare knows this or not, but men communicate in ways that don't involve violently beating the living crap out of one another. Maybe she didn't have brothers growing up or something, I don't know. Anyhow, in the other prison cell, Ron and Hermione uh, start scraping at the wall. They're hoping they can get out of the cell if they can just kind of tunnel their way through, you know, just very slowly scrape at the walls until bricks start moving. They get one brick out and they look inside the hole and it looks like they are looking into another cell. It's Sirius's cell. Meanwhile, in the past, Ginny is explaining the batshit idea she just had to Ben. I don't know why she didn't just end up in the same point that the characters did before the last time they used the time turner. It stated that this time turner only brings people back to a very specific point in time. Yet another inconsistency, but let's just go with it. Ginny is convinced that they're going to need an army to defeat Salazar, and the current wizarding world just doesn't have that. And Ben is kind of like, mm, really? I don't know about that, sis. Ginny is positive that she can use the time turner to take back a ton of soldiers to the present. I hasten to remind you, the Time Turner is just a necklace. She admits that she didn't intend to come back to the past eight years from that previous past's future, if that makes sense, but she thinks she can be more precise with it now. Ben isn't so sure about this because of, you know, potential time paradoxes, people dying in another century and not being able to return to their loved ones or not even being able to be given a proper burial, that kind of thing. And before we can get to hear his decision. We head back to the present. Harry and Draco have decided to start sword fighting to pass the time. And this is when Salazar walks in and is like, oh, oh, so you are going to try and kill Harry after all. Get to it then. And they start to sword fight more with even more energy. And maybe like the sword takes over Draco again. I don't know. All of a sudden Draco lunges towards Harry. And again, he plunges the sword into Harry's chest and Harry slumps over. Harry Potter is dead. And that's how chapter 13 ends. It was 101 pages long. Chapter 14. This is the penultimate chapter. Let's go. Draco's like, no! And he's having like flashbacks to all the memories of the two of them together as friends and as enemies. And Salazar is like, don't tell me you never wished him dead. And he leaves and Draco's just staring. And then Harry starts to move. No, it's not rigor mortis, you silly goose. He's alive. I lied to you all about that. He didn't actually die. Do you feel cheated right now? Because I hope so. Because that's how I felt when I was reading this. Harry slowly gets up and he's like, I'm okay. The wound he just experienced even seems to have vanished. And they're trying to figure out what the hell's happened when all of a sudden a bunch of creepy robed figures appear and they are like, hi, we shall explain everything. Meanwhile, Ginny is still talking to Ben in like the year 1200 or whatever. There's a reason I'm here, he said, waiting here in front of this castle. I know, I'm sorry. He's like, I'm in the middle of something, basically. What about your mother? I was so young when she died. I only know what people told me. It was right around the beginning of the war. The Snake Lord had just come to power and was wreaking havoc on the wizarding world, recruiting dragons and giants to serve him, destroying whole armies, making them vanish. I don't quite understand why Rowena came up in this, but whatever. Ginny suddenly sat up so quickly she knocked her chair over. It clattered on the floor behind her. She was hearing Fleur's voice in her head. Ben, she said hoarsely. He looked up at her. She was gripping the edge of the table so hard her hands hurt. 
Fleur, a friend of mine, once told me that Slytherin had made an entire army vanish into thin air. She said, is that true? Was it more than once? Okay, I think in one of the bedroom conversations I glossed over, Fleur did mention this, and I just kind of missed that while I was taking notes. This isn't out of nowhere, I, I don't think, at least. It was just once, he said. It was when I was 10 years old. An army was sent out from Ravenclaw, a company of about 250 men and warriors and beasts. They never arrived at their destination. Ben, said Ginny again. What if the reason they never arrived wasn't because Slytherin made them vanish? What if it was because we brought them forward into the future? Ben is described as goggling at her in response to this. He's just kind of like, oh? Ginny's like, okay, if I can take the time turner further back and I can get the time right, I could go get that army. Ben takes the time turner and looks at him and is like, hmm, yes, I can help you with that. All we need to do is like reverse the polarity of the neutron flow or whatever. He doesn't actually make a Doctor Who reference if he had I would be so much kinder to Cassandra Clare. I am such a geek. But anyways, Ben's like, yeah, screw it. Let's do that. And I guess he's going with her this time. Jumping back to the castle. Remember how um, Hermione and Ron moved that brick and they saw Sirius in the cell? Sirius has an idea. He's pulling out his Zonko's magic pencils. He has a plan to use them to escape. The same Zonko's pencils, the one you used to draw the Marauder's map. There was an achingly wistful tone to Ron's voice that nearly made Sirius smile. I can't believe it. Okay, pause again. I always kind of assumed the implication was that James and the rest of the Marauders were like astonishingly advanced wizards for their age. Like, the Marauders map is super special and quite unique. It's weird that a student at a school was able to create that. So to just claim that it was just magic pencils that any wizard could buy that brought the Marauders map to life, it's just kind of disappointing, to be honest. And like, yeah, Joanne's world building is pretty bad, but this does not make it better. It makes it worse, in fact. They've stopped making those pencils, you know. They're meant to make drawings come to life, but they tend to work a little too well. They made things come to life, but they worked in odd ways. So you could draw a bowl of porridge that you could actually eat if you concentrated hard enough, but it would give you horrid stomach pings. I could tell you a story about James and a cranberry scone, but I won't. Serious like shoves the box of pencils over to Ron. He then asks Ron to draw a life-size depiction of the cell that Harry was being kept in. They all join hands for some reason, they all concentrate, and Ron gets to work. This is really stupid. Just saying, really stupid. Let's keep going. So, those figures and hoods who have just appeared to Draco and Harry, they have now explained that they are demons. Just like the little scrangly guy who's been following the sword around for a while. They are able to explain why Harry survived. Remember earlier when um the two of them fought the manticore, and there's still some manticore blood on his blade. Manticore blood has healing properties, and as such, Harry was able to survive. I love a good cliffhanger. Even if I know the characters have plot armor, I can suspend my disbelief just enough if it's a good cliffhanger. It's exciting to know how they're going to get out of a bad situation at the very least. This is very disappointing though. So remember the stupid blood debt that Slytherin has to pay? Because according to the nonsense rules of this story, Harry is considered a descendant of Slytherin. They were summoned because the Slytherin blade was used to kill a member of Slytherin's bloodline, and that was kind of what was required for the deal to go through. The demons also reiterate what Wormtail said about them getting the orb, they may be able to defeat Slytherin. If you do not, we cannot take the Snake Lord, and if we cannot take him, we cannot take the sword, said the demons. We cannot even take it from you now, or believe us, we would have done so. So why was, like, the little scraggly guy trying to take it earlier? I, you know, it's funny, in, in breaking down the plot of this story, it's become increasingly clear that it was written with only maybe two, three chapters planned ahead at any given point. And I don't think that every writer has to do like a super detailed like outline, but if you're going to do something this convoluted, you probably should, or at the very least, you should try to be consistent. And this is just not consistent. I'm finding more inconsistencies than I noticed when I was reading it while recapping it. Anyways, the demons then vanish, and right around this point, uh, a wall on the side of the cell suddenly turns into a room, and inside of it are Sirius, Ron, and Hermione. Ron was able to draw the cell. Everyone's just kind of like, yay, and hugs are all around and stuff. Sirius also gives Harry the scabbard to, uh, you know, make sure that he gets his hands on it, because he's going to need it very soon. Heading over to Ginny. Ben, Ginny had decided, was a lovely, angelic sort of person, and it really was too bad that he was so old and also not from her time. There's a scene where... Uh, Ginny and Ben go and meet Salazar's son for some reason. Nothing super important happens in it, 
They get a dragon from him, and then they head back in time. Back in the cell, Hermione has now worked out that Ginny is probably time-traveled. And she also just assumes she'll come back soon. We should just go and look for the orb, and she'll come back in time with any luck. Even though earlier in this book she was very concerned about the risks of time-traveling long distances. But, okay. I really need to stop nitpicking every little thing or else we're gonna be here for forever, I know. They decide that they should just grab the orb, leave the castle, do a locator charm afterwards to figure out where she went, and then they can head back to the castle to defeat Slytherin. Also, in this scene, Harry makes a Star Wars reference, which I think is extremely in character. Harry Potter is very much known for constantly cracking jokes and making pop culture references. It's not jarring whatsoever. Anyways, Ginny and Ben went back in time with the dragon. They found the army. They are explaining themselves to the army. It's not going well. They're trying to be like, you guys vanishing is a historical fact, so you should do it. But obviously, like, if a girl and some guy showed up out of nowhere and was like, hey, we're from the future, we need you to come back with us to the future, I would have some concerns as well. And they are resisting, and there's a lot of arguing, and then we cut back to Salazar's castle in the present. Sirius has split off from everyone else to go find Lupin. He ends up stumbling into Fleur, who decides she wants to help him. They, like, ran into her again all of a sudden. They're running down a corridor, and then all of a sudden, Harry and Hermione... Um, fall into a trap. Ron tries to pull Harry and Hermione out of the trap, but the mentors are coming, and so they're just like, run! And so he does, he runs. The hole is like filled with water, and they eventually realize that they're in like an underground cavern with a underground lake in it. Oh, also there was like a brief moment where Ron like had a sense that something bad was about to happen. It seems like his seer powers are maybe kicking in. They didn't really help, but they are there. And so they see that there's some sort of shore a bit of a distance away from them. And so they start swimming towards it. And then all of a sudden, out of the water, is a bunch of like really pretty mer people. It's Mervila. And the Mervila are like, OMG, hi. We were like so totally given something thousands of years ago to give to the heir of Gryffindor. Are you the heir of Gryffindor? Oh, you are? Okay, here's this magic orb. We don't know what it is, but you're supposed to have it. Bye. And then they just swim off. In a story filled with random encounters and contrivances and all sorts of shit like that, this is the biggest ass pull of all. What the hell? <laughs> Meanwhile, Sirius has found the room Lupin is in, and they're talking, they're catching up, and then they look out the window, and they gasp. Right outside the gates of Salazar Slytherin's castle is an army, hundreds of people. Ginny is back, and she did it. She convinced them to come through. Ron and Draco are running off. I guess Draco was a part of the, that group that was running when Harry and Hermione fell, and I just didn't make a proper note of that. I apologize for nothing. This video is such a mess. Oh my god. I hope you guys are having as much fun as I am with this story, or at the very least the experience of having it recapped. As I was saying, <laughs> Ron and Draco are running. The Dementors are still coming after them. Draco casts his Patronus. He summons his, you know, magic, misty dragon. It blows the Dementors away. They are out on, like, a tower balcony now at this point, and then they look up and they also gasp because now they're looking straight into the eyes of an actual dragon and there's someone riding it. It's Ginny Weasley. She grabs the two of them, pulls them onto the dragon. She flies them down to the war camp that has been established outside of Salazar's walls. Meanwhile, I guess there was like a staircase out of that underground cavern to lead back to the rest of the castle. Harry and Hermione have gotten to the room with the other orb in it because again, there are so many orbs in this story, and they both head over to it. They notice that there's like a pentagram drawn on the floor, and then Salazar appears. He was hiding underneath the invisibility cloak because I guess they left it in the prison cell earlier. And that is when the army attacks the castle. We are heading to our climax. I hope you're excited. It is complete and total chaos. Creatures clashing against creatures, soldiers running around everywhere. Harry and Hermione are now tied up, and Salazar is evilly monologuing to them. He berates Hermione, saying that Rowena's bloodline has now been tainted by muggle blood. You know, I've, I've, I've ranted enough at this point about wizarding bloodlines, so moving forward. He also wants Gryffindor, so Harry, to suffer. So he takes the invisibility cloak, and he takes a knife, and he stabs into it and tears it 
repeatedly until it's nothing but shreds. The only object Harry has from his father is now gone. Just then, Draco and Ginny burst through the door. I'm not sure where Ron went. They rush over to the orb. Harry and Hermione try and call out to them, but Salazar cackles and says that they have been put under a glamour alongside him. No one can perceive them, period. Ginny takes her key and she presses it to the magic orb, the one with Salazar's powers in it, and for some reason it opens. I guess because all the heirs were present in the room at the time, it worked. A beam of light shoots out of it and directly into Salazar's chest. He takes down the glamour and reveals himself and these two to Draco and Ginny, and he's laughing maniacally. He's at full power now. It was as if he had grown many feet in stature. He radiated power, a blank and shimmering power, an ominously tinted light poured from his eyes, and a halo of intense and pulsing energy seemed to surround him. He smiles. All he has to do now is give Harry over to the demons, and his debt will be paid, and he'll be all set to invade with his army. And he also in this moment informs Draco that with his full strength, it doesn't matter if Draco wants to resist him or not. Salazar is so powerful, he can force Draco to do whatever he wants. Draco felt his feet move against his own volition, carrying him forward like a piece of driftwood caught in a powerful tide. He fought it, bit down on his lip, tasted blood in his mouth, but it was useless. The orb had opened, and so Slytherin had his powers back, and with them, the powers afforded to him by his bargain with hell. Draco felt himself driven forward, and then he stumbled and fell to his knees before the Snake Lord. He looked up. Harry, Hermione, and Ginny stared down at him from their prisons of rope. Ginny looked desperately furious. Hermione, despairing and panicked. Harry's face was white, set, and unreadable. And Draco saw he was struggling, with as little evident effort as possible, to free his left hand from the ropes that bound it to his side. He felt Harry reach out towards him, and his voice whispered softly to the back of Draco's mind, distract him. Salazar cocked his head to the side. Tell me, he said. Draco heard his own voice, dry and eroded sounding, as if it came from far away. Tell you what? What do you see in them? Those three that you love in their different ways. I loved once as well, such as those. Then I put that away as I put away childish things, but you will not let it go. What can they offer you that I, who offer you everything, cannot? Draco shut his eyes. Printed against the back of his lids, he saw them. Ginny, bright with spirit. Hermione, who he had loved and Harry, who he knew better than his own self. What can they give you that I cannot? He raised his chin and looked at Slytherin. Hope, he said. Harry is still working through his ropes, trying to get his hand free. And this is the moment where Slytherin orders Draco to untie Harry and drag him to the center of the pentagram so the demons can come and grab him immediately. He also casts a spell onto Draco, which forces Draco to be trapped within his own mind while Slytherin puppeteers his body towards Harry. Hermione stared in horror. Draco was kneeling again, his fingers unfastening the cords that bound Harry's ankles. She knew, of course, that he was being controlled, that otherwise this was something he would never do, but it was cold comfort given the danger Harry was in. But then, she turned her head back to Harry and saw him raise his hand and throw something hard at the floor. The tiny white orb, the one from the Vilas. It struck the flagstones and shattered, and from from its shattering exploded a bursting, blinding white light. The light leaped up, refracted and split into three white arrows. One arrow flew towards Hermione and struck against the lycanth at her throat. She felt it grow very hot, then cold. The second arrow soared towards Ginny and struck her wrist where the time-turner was bound. The third flew at Harry, and the scabbard at his side glowed as the light collided with it. Harry raised his head and smiled at her again, this time with exultation. What was that? Ginny's voice now, astonished. The last piece of the puzzle, said Harry. The keys are all connected now, said Hermione, in a passion of amazement, without us having to touch them or each other. Oh, good work, Harry. I thought that when they were connected, they made a weapon, observed Ginny. They do. They did, said Hermione, a tiny spark of confidence growing inside her chest. It's us. We are the weapon. All of us together have a strength that not one of us alone could possess. But we're not all together, said Ginny, her eyes on Draco. That, said Harry and his eyes were glowing with a steady green fire, is going to change. Draco is mentally spiraling. He is still trapped in his mind. He's convinced he's a monster. He is an accessory to these horrors and further horrors down the line if Salazar wins. There's no point. A dull and weightless despair had settled on him. Kill me then. I give up. Kill you? Ginny's thoughts jolted with shock. Kill me. You're the keys, the weapon. Destroy me if you have to. Death would be better than where I am now. They are talking to him telepathically. Should make that clear. He heard Ginny's voice again. You think this is what you are, but it isn't. Then Harry cut in over her. Let me tell you something, Malfoy. There's no such thing as what you are. You want to believe it because it means you won't have to make any choices. But there are always choices. Every second of your life, you're choosing to be one thing or the other, and that's what makes you who you are. So what are you, Malfoy? Draco is still resisting, and so that is when Harry brings out his ultimate weapon. Toxic masculinity. I'm not a coward, he said. Aren't you? If it was me, I'd fight. But I guess that's just me. I've always had to fight for everything. I'm not some spoiled little rich boy who's had everything handed to him on a plate. You never had to get by on any merit of your own. I guess that's why you're so spineless. This was so monstrously unfair that it actually broke through the gray fog in Draco's brain. Spoiled? 
He could hear the rage in his own mental voice. You goddamn know better than that, Potter. If you said that to my face, you know I'd break your fingers. Draco is raging. That rage is pulsing through his body, through his head, and as it radiates out from within, he can feel the strings attaching him to Salazar Slytherin snapping one by one. He is no longer Slytherin's puppet. Draco turns to face Salazar, reaches out his hand, and shouts, Accio! The Sword of Slytherin flies across the room. Draco grabs it. It's shearing with light. Wait, why did I write shearing? I meant shining. <laughs> okay. Draco runs at Salazar and lunges at him with a sword. Draco brought the sword down, a wave of brilliant green fire. The blade struck against the Snake Lord's wrist, nearly severing his hand. He shrieked aloud as fire poured from his wounded arm, an indescribable shriek of rage and horror, and his severed hand tumbled at Draco's feet. Beyond disgust, beyond anything but a terrible sort of euphoria, Draco seized the mutilated hand of the Snake Lord, clamped its fingers around the hilt of the sword, and flung them together into the pentagram inked on the floor. He threw his head back then, and, his voice furious and carrying, shouted at the invisible forces of hell, There you go! You're half of the bargain, given to you by his own hand, by the hand of the Snake Lord himself, Take it, damn you, and use it! There was a dreadful silence. The Snake Lord had fallen to his knees, clutching the stump of his hand from which little tongues of flame flickered between his fingers. There was no blood. And then, there's a loud crack. Darkness pours out of the pentagram. It swirls around Salazar. The last thing Draco heard as darkness took him was the sound of the Snake Lord's scream. So yeah, Draco, like, passed out after that for whatever reason, and he wakes up in the army camp that Ben has set up outside the castle. The castle, speaking of which, is gone. Hermione says that the castle came apart piece by piece. The dark creatures who had been called to it fled into the woods. Draco takes a moment to look at his arm. The dark mark, which was branded onto it, it's vanished. And with that realization, Draco Malfoy slides blissfully to sleep. That ends chapter 14. It was 112 pages. And we're not done yet. We've got one last chapter, and it's the story's denouement. Final day of filming. Let's do this. As I'm sure you can see, I am wearing my I Have Been Victimized by Cassandra Clare t-shirt, because you know what? I've never met the woman. I don't know much about her. But after reading all of this and telling you about it, it's true. I have been victimized by Cassandra Clare. This shirt, incidentally, um, I did design it, but I had it printed for me by a lovely friend of mine, JV Block. She is a black trans YouTuber on here at time of recording. She has just released a two-part series about mermaids and their queerness. Give that a look once we're done here. You know, as I was taking notes on this story, I was reading War and Peace. Genuinely, it may be the greatest book I have ever read, and there were multiple times in preparing for this project where I wished I was talking about that instead. Genuinely, it's so complicated, it's so d dense, yet so satisfying. Actually, let me know in the comments if you want me to recap War and Peace. <laughs> I'm not going to, not anytime soon, sorry. Anyways, last chapter, 60 pages left. Let's do this. Before we do, I just want to talk about one thing about chapter 14, and that is at the end of it, we have our last illustration of the book. It is a wonderful portrait of our four heirs. With that in mind, let's head into chapter 15. Chapter 15 opens up with yet another epigraph, and you know, I love me an epigraph, but I also think that, like, to use them inconsistently, only in some chapters and not the others, just feels a little off. I don't know. Say goodbye to all those ne'er-do-wells. Smile in the religion and then smile farewell. Your magic doesn't need the failing spells. Of those that never understand, and manners they will find no place. With those that have no saving grace. With you I see the irony of anyone who has no face. That is from a band, I am assuming, called Aztec Camera, and a song titled Mattress of Wire. Maybe it's the other way around, I'm not sure. On the evening before Harry Potter's 17th birthday, not two weeks after his last glimpse of Salazar Slytherin, Draco left the manor where Harry, Hermione, Sirius, and Narcissa were playing Exploding Snap by the fireplace, and went and sat on the hill, overlooking the house where they had buried what remained of his father. The darkness had touched them all, but only Draco had nearly been swallowed up by it, had been inside it, had it been the darkness. The dark mark was gone from his arm, but the memory of everything that had happened still burned against the back of his eyes. There was still so much to be sorted through, to be understood, to be forgiven, and to try to forget. He found himself restless, wandering the dark halls of the manor at night, staring at his own reflection in mirrors, looking for answers and finding none. Draco heads down the hill. He gets to the mausoleum where his father's buried. And even though he's alone, he starts talking to Lucius. Human beings do this sort of thing when they're grieving. He just wanted the same thing you did. A tool. Something to use to advance his own power. You played at being God. Made me in the image the Dark Lord wanted. Never really wanting a son at all. Well, you're not Godfather. 
He heard his own voice rise and sharpen, cutting the warm summer air. And I'm not weak. You told me I'd break like a clock wound backwards, but I didn't break. Draco's thinking about how his father's probably in hell right now, which is where he deserves to be. And then he hears a voice, almost in the back of his mind. You are, after all, only what I made you to be. The words seemed spoken inside his brain. He heard them out. And then it came, what he had waited for, half expecting, half dreading. Grief like a roiling black wave. It rolled up and over him. Drago, at this point, is beginning to kind of tremble, kind of hyperventilating. He staggers and falls against the wall. And thank goodness he was followed because Syria saw him head down the hill and he's been following him in dog form ever since. And he transforms back into a human and he attempts to comfort Draco. Sirius holds Draco close. He's been told that Draco never cries. Cry, he said. Cry if you have to if you can. But Draco pulled away from him and sat back against the cold, dark marble of the mausoleum, shaking his blonde head. His face was blank and dry of tears. Blonde head? Is that weird? Is that like a weird description? I don't know. No, he said. I can't. And so Sirius sits with him in silence for several minutes while Draco just lies there curled up in a ball. It's the next day and loads of parcels are being delivered to the manor. I guess both Harry and Draco are getting gifts from people. And they're also getting like fan mail from like the general public who it seems somehow know that they saved the world, maybe. Included in these parcels is a lot of leather pants because somehow that detail's gotten out to the rest of the world. Listen to this, said Ron, rolling over on his back and holding the prophet open above him. Happy birthday, Harry. The interest of the wizarding world, so long riveted on the mysterious disappearance of the boy who lived, will tonight center around a much happier event. His 17th birthday party, held this year at Malfoy Manor, the ancient familial seat of the powerful Malfoy clan, now home as well to Sirius Black. All right, this bit's boring, so I'm skipping it. That's, that's, that's what it says. It's not me saying that. Enormous guest list, blah, blah. Hundreds of wizards and witches invited, blah. Including Mom, Arthur Weasley and headmaster of Hogwarts, Albus Dumbledore, miraculously recovered from his state of magically induced stasis. A miracle of wizarding medicine, says Dr. Simon Branford. It was not a miracle, snaps Ginny irritably. It was because Draco killed Slytherin, so all of his spells ended. That's right, you heard correctly. It is Harry's birthday, and Sirius is throwing, like, the biggest bash ever for him. Everyone important is being invited, which is not something I can imagine Harry actually wanting. And he seems a bit reticent about it, but Sirius is kind of like, you've had so many non-birthdays that I want to make it up to you by giving you one big one. There's also now like chocolate frog cards of both Draco and Harry. Sirius was briefly in talks about like someone making action figures that move around of the two of them. And he has the prototypes with him. He's not going to actually agree to this company using their likeness, but he still spoke to them about it. Anyways, Mr. and Mrs. Weasley have arrived. Yes, believe it or not, he is in fact still Minister of Magic. I still don't understand that, but let's keep going. Draco heads up to his bedroom. Hermione's up there, and she is making a potion. Specifically, she is making a pensive potion, and we don't know what they are yet, but Draco puts his wand to his forehead, and he draws out some memories and puts it into the potion. She spoke then without thinking, is there something between you and Ginny? She heard herself ask. For there to be something between me and Ginny, there would have to be something of myself I could give her. I don't think there's much of me left to give anyone right now. Draco, you're the holest person I know. More so than Harry? You're the same. He shook his head. I have to wait. Draco, she burst out, without really knowing what she was saying. If things were different, stop, he said, and she did. He looked at her for a long moment, standing so still that every previous stillness of his seemed an incomplete copy of this one. What does that mean? Finally, he spoke, and she closed her eyes as he spoke, hearing only the cadences of his soft voice and the words it shaped. For a long time, he said, I waited to hear you say that if there was no Harry in your life, then you would be with me. I waited, but you never said it. And finally, I realized that you never would. Not because you don't want me, just because it doesn't matter. Because you would never imagine a life for yourself without Harry in it. She looked at him profoundly shaken. Her voice, when she spoke, was just above a whisper. You can love more than one person at once, you know. Oh yes, he said. I know. They head downstairs now. Malfoy Manor's been transformed, incidentally. It used to be like really creepy and grotesque, but right now it looks beautiful and grand. It also turns out that Narcissa is like extremely superstitious. So like she was really particular about the day that the party was on because it was gonna be like good astrologically speaking. She doesn't want certain colors used because they may be bad luck. It's very random, but I do kind of like this as a character beat for her. I do like giving her a bit more depth. I also think it's just kind of fun in a world where magic and the supernatural exists for there to still be um, superstitions 
that are probably still not true. There's a lot of time just spent on these characters interacting, bickering, etc. There's a lot of random details like Charlie Weasley showing up and gifting Sirius with a bottle of giant wine. And yeah, like all the Weasleys are being invited. Charlie is here. Bill is coming. He's got Floor with him. And also Fred and George are coming and they each have like their own matching female twin who is their date. And I'm just kind of picturing them as like the female twins from Zack and Cody, but like grown up. I hope they're doing okay. I don't know what happened to them. And amongst all this, Draco and Ginny have their own end of character arc moment. During this, Draco asks Ginny about something he's noticed in reading about the history of the founders and their descendants, which is that sporadically, some mysterious red-headed girl would just show up and vanish every once in a while. And he wants to know if it's Ginny. I guess she must still have the time turner, I'm not really sure. But Ginny's not telling, and she's also not telling anyone what happened with Ben and the entire army she brought back from the past. Ginny shook her head. Oh, Draco, that's a long story, and I have to run. At this rate, I'll be half-dressed when the party starts. I really want to know what happened. Someone write that fanfiction, please. Oh, also, yeah, uh, much of what we're about to cover is just kind of set up for the next book in the trilogy, so just a heads up. More guests are coming. Floor has arrived with Bill, and I am just going to share this quote out of context. Floor shrugged. There is nothing wrong with leopard print underwear, she said breezily. I am wearing some myself. I didn't need to know this. But then someone arrives. Somebody no one recognizes. There's a butler like announcing each guest one by one. And then all of a sudden he announces Resen Malfoy. Okay, so slight context here. In the Harry Potter fandom at the time, there was another very popular fanfic writer who went by the name Resand. Is it Resand or Resand? I'm not sure. I've written Resand here. Let's go with that. She just so happened to be friends with Cassandra Clare. I think she had her own either live journal page or Yahoo group or something devoted to her own fan fiction. I think maybe some of Cassandra Clare's writing was also cross-posted there. That's who this is. That individual who Cassandra Clare has written into the fic and she's gonna be important. She said she was a Malfoy, said Charlie. She looks like a Malfoy. Doesn't mean she's invited, said Hermione, who knew how convoluted and expansive the Malfoy family connections were. Anyways, like, Rhysand is like tall and ethereal and black-haired and mysterious. But before we can investigate that mystery anymore, Charlie pulls Harry to the side and he's like, by the dragon camp, which is, you know, by the castle where Salazar was, I encountered this mysterious hooded figure. Charlie drew his hand out of his pocket at last and with it, the object he had been holding, he said, Dragon Rider, take this to the heir of Gryffindor, the one who lived. It will keep him safe when all else fails, when charms and spells prove useless and his magic powers have forsaken him. Give it to him if you value his life. It was a rough sort of circle made of a dark scarlet black material that glowed like ruby syrup shot through with charcoal. It looked like glass, but when Harry took it in his hand, he found it much heavier and denser than glass and more flexible, like a thin steel cable. Nobody can tell what this is, but he just takes it and pockets it. Meanwhile, Fleur has approached Draco and she still wants to be paid back for the favor she thinks she's owed for from like 800 pages ago. Draco shook his head. Fleur was impossible. I suppose you want me to make mad, passionate love to you right here on the dance floor. She widened her indigo eyes. Not at all. I was hoping you might buy me a house. In the south of France, I think. Floor, get over this. It was not that big of a favor. It doesn't have to be that big of a house, she said reasonably. You know, this is ridiculous and Floor is kind of annoying, but I do appreciate the commitment to the bit. I think at this point, Floor is just kind of trolling him, to be honest. Draco walks away from Floor, runs back into Ginny. They exchange some retorts. He ends up leaning in to kiss her, but before she can, they are interrupted by Risen, who should probably have a picture on the board, but... It's a bit late for me to print something out now. Now oh well. Hello, Draco, she said. Do you remember me? Draco goggled at her. He wanted to snap at her, but there was something about her demeanor that held him back. She looked oddly familiar, and yet he couldn't place her at all. Who are you, he demanded, knowing he sounded impolite, but then it had been rather impolite for this witch to interrupt an obviously private moment. Draco narrowed his eyes. You're from the Singapore branch of the family, aren't you, he said, recalling that the golden ruby poppies had been the symbol adopted by those Malfoys who had moved east into Singapore in the 1800s to make a killing by exporting illegal Chinese fireball dragon's blood. Okay. Risen wants to dance with him. Draco is at first very resistant. Remember, he doesn't dance or whatever. But then he notices that she's wearing a ring on her finger, and he recognizes it. It's a ring his father 
always wore. She's somehow taken it from his death scene. Anyways, they begin to slow dance. She tossed her hair back. It's a message, she said. You might not like it. The message, she purred, is hidden inside my bodies, if you'd care to try and find it. And Draco's like, I'm not gonna stick my hand down your bodice on the dance floor. That would just be deeply inappropriate. He says he needs more room, and then Rhysan puts her hand back into his and moves it away. Within Draco's palm is his father's ring. Rhysan grabs him and pulls him into a side room somewhere. She smiled again and tossed her hair so that it ran down her back like a river of black ink. She inhaled, which given the state of her clothes was impressive. I'm giving you room, she said. The message, come and find it. And he did. Resen is then like, oh, I have done what I was requested to do. And she kind of just like simpers on out of the room, letting Draco have a moment to himself. The message is written on a piece of parchment. Draco, that was a very amusing show you put on last night, ranting and raving at my gravesite. Most of what you said was a ridiculous adolescent posturing, but I would agree with you on one point. I am not God, nor have I ever pretended to be. And unlike God, I have no plans to give over my only son to the rabble, the Potters and the Blacks and the Weasleys and the rest of the trash of this world. You belong to me, Draco. You always have. And to that dark power under whose auspices we are both bound. You know of whom I speak. He sends his thanks to you for ridding the world of the only wizard who could have stood against him in his rise. I myself confess I had my doubts that you were capable, but his faith in you never faltered. Whatever powers he gifted you in your childhood when he passed on his air of Slytherin status to you, they are beyond anything even I might have imagined. Your rebellious nature troubles me, but he assures me that it can be curbed given the right incentives. In any case, for the first time, you have made me proud of you. I enclose our family signet ring as a token that I consider you at last a real Malfoy. Wear it and wait for word from me. I shall come to you on your true birthday. Expect me. Know that I am watching you and that I am, as always, your father, Lucius Nero Malfoy. Fuck. That's right. Lucius is still alive somehow. It probably has something to do with the ritual he did in his cell before his, like, desiccated remains were found. And it seems like everything Draco's done this entire story in trying to defeat Salazar is exactly what Voldemort wanted him to do. He is still a pawn in a game that he has no control over. Rhysen is not done fucking shit up though. She then heads on over to Harry. Harry's been dancing with like a bunch of girls from school with Hermione's permission, of course. He's just kind of having a good time. But Rhysen intervenes once again. She's got some cryptic words about the weird bracelet stone thing that Charlie frowned. It has like runes all over it and she wants to tell him what they mean. That rune augurs betrayal, she said. Those who you think you can trust, you cannot trust. Those to whom you will go to seek advice will offer you false counsel. Your enemies will find you out and your friends will arrive too late to give you aid. And you know, it just hit me. There are 19 pages left in this fan fiction and we are still getting more fucking jewelry. I can't stand it. Legitimately, I can't stand it. We're also not done with gift giving. Hermione has a gift for Harry. I didn't write down what it was because this is page 100 of my notes and I wanted to be kind to myself. It's also not important. Elsewhere in the party, Sirius is having a conversation with Mr. Weasley. Arthur, I never congratulated you on your appointment as minister. You couldn't have gone to a more deserving man. Arthur Weasley's voice was troubled as he replied. I'm not so sure, Sirius. At first I was flattered, but lately it seems to me that many of the ministry officials I've spoken to felt somewhat afraid not to vote for me. It's almost the way it was back when, Arthur, you're being paranoid. No, serious, I don't think I am. I was actually wondering if perhaps, well, with your RR training, and that conversation trails off, and we don't find out what it's about in this book. Draco is now darting around through the party. He's trying to find Rhysand. He wants answers, and she hasn't given them to anyone, to be fair. But he's away, but he's waylaid by Albus Dumbledore. Dumbledore has also noticed that Rhysen is at the party and he also wants to talk to her. The two of them have like their own little conversation. It is so funny to me that I decided to put Mad-Eye Moody on the board, but I didn't think to find a picture to represent Rhysen, who is doing a lot more than Mad-Eye ever does in this. Oh well, too late now. Dumbledore also was somehow able to tell that Rhysen really wanted to talk to Malfoy, and he really wants to know why. Draco takes a deep breath, and he tells Dumbledore everything. He tells him how apparently his father is alive, he was gifted this ring, and he doesn't know what to do now. Obviously, Draco is feeling a way about being manipulated. Dumbledore tells him that regardless, it's a good thing that Salazar's been defeated. That is just inherently a good thing. And as for defeating Voldemort, well, defeating Salazar was Draco's fight but defeating Voldemort will be Harry's. Draco is continuing to be surprisingly vulnerable with Dumbledore, someone who he 
doesn't have much of a relationship with, I have to admit. He still thinks deep down that he is a monster because of what he saw in the magic anti-mirror of Irised. And that's when Dumbledore tells him. The mirror of Irised has no twin. That was a trick. It was just enchanted to, you know, make a person hate themselves so that person could look into it and feel the worst they possibly can. That is not reality. Those are the black terrors of your own mind. Dumbledore shook his head. You've lived a short life, Draco Malfoy. In that short life, you've been many things. Spiteful sometimes, foolish as well. You've lied to bring harm to others and been silent when you should have spoken out. But you've changed. Draco heads on out. He wants to talk to Harry now. Draco heads on out of this conversation and we get this cryptic bit of prose. The headmaster watched the boy as he crossed the room, the firelight striking cold silver sparks from his hair, the set of his shoulders so like that of another boy Dumbledore had once taught, another boy with silver hair and eyes like gray morning light. Lucius, who, like his son, had been touched by destiny, the mark of something special had been on him, as it was on Draco. Whether Draco was meant for a greater good or a greater darkness, Dumbledore could not be sure. There was no way to be sure. He could only wait. Cryptic, I know. Draco is still wandering around the party now. He is looking for Harry, and that is when he decides to just go screw it, and he sends a telepathic message out to Harry. They need to talk. Oh, side note, at this point in writing my notes, I somehow discovered that the word eyes is used about 50 times in this one chapter, which is kind of nuts. Draco then takes Harry up to the room Hermione was in before with the potion. He shows Harry the potion and he explains the memory that he has put inside the pensive potion is the moment from when he was in the afterlife and he spoke to Harry's parents. Harry stops, open-mouthed. You won't like everything you hear and see, said Draco. No, said Harry. I don't expect to. I didn't want to hurt you anymore, said Draco. His voice was dry. Still don't. But otherwise, I was jealous, said Harry calmly. Draco blinked. You were what? I was jealous, said Harry. His eyes were dark, malachite in the shadowy half-light. You got to see my parents and I didn't. I was jealous and it tore me up inside. He lifted the pensive slightly. This makes it better. So yeah, this is the way Draco is showing that he's sorry for um, pissing Harry off about this earlier. They continue to talk and conversation moves on to the next year. This is gonna be their final year at Hogwarts. They're in different houses. They're captains of opposing Quidditch teams. And so they decide for some reason that People can't know that they're actually friends. It'll be too complicated for everyone at school if they know it, even though presumably everyone's going to know that they are half-brothers, but whatever. They decide then that they'll just have to keep pretending to hate one another, faking it for the benefit of everyone. I don't get it either, don't worry. Draco smiles. He looks out onto the party downstairs, onto the friends, the family, the guests that have all come to celebrate. Yes, they may have come to celebrate, Harry's birthday, but nonetheless he is a part of that. For so many years this house was a lonely prison for him, and now it is filled with laughter. Harry turns to him and asks what he's thinking, and Draco says, I'm not thinking. I'm looking. I'm looking at my happy memory. Get it? Circling back to that moment from earlier? It's kind of clever. And with that, Draco Sinister comes to a close. 996 pages of plot have been recapped. We're done. So yeah, um, thank you for coming. I bought a tripod for this and I bought a microphone. I spent money on printing out my notes and the visual aids. I hope it was worth it. I hope you had fun. This has been exhausting and I'm kind of dreading the task I have ahead of me in editing these two videos, but I hope you had as much fun watching it as I did filming it. And with the story done, I feel like I should give some final thoughts. So I want to circle back to the first book in this trilogy, Dor Draco Dormian's, for just a moment, because I think it's worth giving context. That story was fun. It was flawed, but it was fun. But it did also really drag after, like, the halfway point. This story, contrasted with that one, is even more of a drag. It has its fun moments, but it is just so ridiculous. I just, I can't. I, I, I really just can't with much of what happens in this. I think it gets a little too wrapped up in its semantics, you know, all these different magical items and their individual rules. And to make that worse, oftentimes Cassandra Clare will contradict those rules or just retcon them. You can tell that she was probably just writing only knowing what like the next two or three chapters were going to be at any given point. Like there was definitely no structured outline for this in the slightest. I can say that with some certainty. I don't hate every idea in this. I just think it needs to be 
super trimmed down. There was a whole subplot about the potion Snape made to help people resist, like, the influence of evil. It kind of didn't go anywhere in the long run, so I just didn't really bring it up that much. There are a lot of random narrative cul-de-sacs like that. Like, I think the biggest standout moment for me in that respect was that bit in, I want to say, chapter 10 or 11, where, like, Slytherin and Wormtail attack the burrow, and there's a split second where we think that Charlie is dead. I say split second, but it was more like six or seven pages that I just glossed over. Very painful to just read all that and then discover that it didn't actually matter. And then you also have stuff like the Mervilas showing up at the last minute with, like, some grand MacGuffin that helps defeat Slytherin out of nowhere. That is just bad writing, I'm sorry. This probably wasn't meant to be this long, I imagine, at first, but... I can't say that for certain one way or another. I will say in recapping it, I did make the bare bones of the story sound a lot more fun than they actually were to read, which I suppose is kind of the point of doing recaps like this, you know, getting the best parts of a story across without the viewer having to go and seek it out themselves. Yes, stuff like Slytherin coming back from the dead is stupid and the love potion shenanigans were annoying. There are bits and pieces here that I don't hate. Just needed to be edited, like super, super edited. This could probably have been half as long and I'd probably call it like a convoluted but fun romp if you turn your brain off. And then we have Draco Malfoy himself. This take on the character, looking at it now, post book seven is just kind of funny. I really do think that the fanon interpretation of Draco is so different from the actual one that it's practically a different character. And I know that's why we have terms like Draco and other pants to reflect that, but it's still funny to witness. I just think that his character arc is super drawn out and repetitious after a point. Didn't have to be, but this story is not well paced, like I've said several times in the past few minutes already. The question we now have is pretty clear, I think. This is book two of three in the Draco trilogy. I've now covered the first two. What's up with the third one? Book three is called Draco Veritas, and it's kind of interesting. For one thing, from what I can tell, it seems like it's structured a bit more like a traditional Harry Potter book. It's telling its story over the course of a full year, or at least I'm assuming it is, with how things were set up at the end of this one. I have not read it. When I started making the first Draco trilogy video, I'd already read books one and two of the trilogy, but I hadn't touched that one, so I'm, I'm just kind of using conjecture when I say that. I could be wrong. It was also released over the course of about five years, whilst both this and the last one were released over the course of probably a year and a half collectively, I want to say. In the course of those five years, the actual Harry Potter books, five and six, Order of the Phoenix and Half-Blood Prince, were released to the public. I'm kind of wondering if the fic will reflect things like characters introduced in those, or plot points introduced in those. Am I forgetting anything else notable about this fanfiction? Oh, yes. Draco Veritas is 16 chapters long, it has two epilogues, and the PDF for it is 1700 pages long. It is almost twice as long as this fic is. With that in mind, I'm kind of not surprised it took five years to write, each chapter is probably like a hundred pages long. And just like, what the fuck, Cassie? That's not, that's not okay. There's no reason for it to be written like that. I am sorry. So, will I be covering it? I don't know. If this video specifically, part two of me talking about Draco Sinister, does really well in the algorithm, I will make plans to talk about it next year. I can't say precisely when, but I will do it. Thank you so much for watching. If I have planned things out correctly, there should be a new video up either next week or the week after that. What did you think of this? I want to know in the comments. Did you have fun hearing about the story, even if it wasn't particularly good? Or do you have any favorite moments, any thoughts on the ships, or how Cassandra Clare depicts some of the characters? I am genuinely proud of myself for the progress I'm making on this video. I was absolutely gobsmacked when the first Draco trilogy just kind of exploded and I got a lot of people asking for more, so thank you. If it wasn't for the people who asked, you wouldn't be watching this right now. It's been kind of crazy. Whenever I tell people that I'm doing this, I they don't say anything, but I, I feel like they they think it's really weird, but whatever. You guys get it.
and I'm having fun. With all that said, please like and subscribe. I have a lot of other stuff coming up, a lot of fandom history stuff. I'm sure if you liked this, you're gonna like whatever I have coming up next. So stick around, I'd appreciate it. I'm David M, and I need some new leather pants.